Hey everyone, welcome back to another episode of the Easy Conversations podcast, a podcast about having easy conversations, where every week we dive into the topics of mental health, adversity, spirituality, and societal issues. I'm your host, Furkan Dambia, and join me in this week's episode, which has another enlightening conversation with the esteemed Raju Hajela. This thought-provoking episode unravels the intricate relationship between mental health and spirituality, uncovering pathways to a deeper connection with ourselves. Dr. Hajela is a pioneer in holistic healing, and he shares profound insights into the complexities of the human mind and the significance of spiritual nourishment in our mental well-being. Together, we explore the pitfalls of solely relying on medications to address mental disorders advocating for a more holistic approach that encompasses the spiritual dimension of healing. Besides spirituality, we also go down a philosophical discussion around what are some of the we experience today and how some of those can be self-induced. Dr. Raju Hajila obtained his MD from Dalhousie University in 1982 and his Master of Public Health from the Harvard School of Public Health in 1988. He is a primary care physician who was in the Canadian Forces from 1979 to 1995. He participated in the Military Drug and Alcohol Prevention Program and the Alcoholism Rehabilitation Program throughout his CF career until his last post as the Director of the Residential Treatment Program in Kingston. Dr. Hajila has published taught and spoken widely, having held faculty positions at Queen's University and the University of Calgary. He is the president and medical director of Health Upwardly Mobile, which is based locally here in Calgary, and the medical advisor to the Foundation for Addiction and Mental Health. Dr. Hajela grew up in Lucknow, India and migrated to Canada in 1974. I really hope you get a lot out of this episode, and if at the end you could leave a five-star review, or a comment, I would truly appreciate it. And a brief word for our sponsors. One of the things that's really helped my mental health is a daily routine. Every morning after doing some breathing exercises and cold exposure, I like a smooth cup of coffee. I've been drinking Four Sigmatics coffee for the last three years, and it's been very beneficial for my routine. I especially like their Lion's Mane and Chaga Mushrooms coffee, which helps me with my mental focus and energy every morning. Four Sigmatic is on a mission to infuse functional mushrooms into the foods and supplements people love and use daily. Their goal is to enrich minds and improve well-being. By pairing Lion's Mane with coffee for focus, or reishi with cacao for a sense of calm. Their brews, blends, and powders get everyone in a good headspace so they can focus on what matters most. Check out Four Sigmatic and use the code Easy Conversations, all one word, at checkout for 10% off your order. Today's episode is also sponsored by BetterHelp. Therapy can be very difficult for many people to start. In my personal experience, when I was going through my divorce, therapy allowed me to bridge a significant gap. With the help and support of my therapist, I was able to uncover a lot of repeated patterns and behaviors that were impacting my life. Through goal setting, I was able to focus on things that required attention, which allowed me to improve the relationship that I had with myself, and by extension, the relationship that I had with others. As a therapist, I've been able to see the positive benefits that clients are able to derive through healthy rapport and goal setting. BetterHelp allows a lot of flexibility where clients can schedule video sessions, sessions on the phone, or through messaging. In most cases, BetterHelp will match you up with a licensed therapist within 48 hours. If that's not a good fit for you, BetterHelp will work with you to find the right Join over 4 million users today by following the link in the description or going to BetterHelp, that's H-E-L-P, betterhelp.com slash EZ10 to get 10% off your first month of therapy.
All right, Dr. Hajela, welcome to the Easy Conversations podcast. Thank you for joining me today. I'm really honored to have you on and really excited about our conversation. I've been fortunate enough to meet you in person, so I'm happy to have this discussion. But before we jump into it today and go on our conversation, I do want to give you an opportunity to let the listeners know a little bit about yourself, who you are, and what it is that you do, and then we'll take it from there. Thank you very much for inviting me, Furpan. Uh, it's been a pleasure to meet you and uh, looking forward to this conversation. Uh, I grew up in India and uh, I came to Canada in 1974 at the age of 15. So it was a tricky time in life to, to move and move to unfamiliar country, unfamiliar people, unfamiliar ways. But I made the best of it finishing high school and my undergraduate interest was actually physics and mathematics. And calculus still remains one of my favorite subjects, much to the chagrin of a lot of people. And I read about physics as entertainment and as much as I never became a physicist, but I'm a physicist at heart and I like keeping up with advances and following physicists such as Brian Greene, especially, and, and a few others. So it, it's been an interesting life when I was in university. Medicine was supposed to be something that people were aspiring to. So I actually applied to one medical school one time and they took me in. So <laughs> I was quite young and I had this crazy notion that maybe I'll get my MD and then come back to physics. But of course, medicine has a cadence and momentum of its own. Plus, I was really interested in human behavior and what made people ill and what gets people better. And the medical school was a bit of a disappointment because it's more focused on disease and prescribing medications. So I became more interested in preventive medicine and even to the extent that I joined the Canadian forces because I wasn't ready to commit to a practice somewhere in an office. So I thought the military would offer me some opportunity to keep people healthier and also give me opportunity to travel because uh, that's another interest of mine. I, I like history and I like people and cultures from all around the world. So I got to do all of that. And uh, inherently also the military, when I looked into it, they had a drug and alcohol prevention program and also an alcoholism rehabilitation program. And even in my teen years before uh, coming into medical school and then in medical school, I saw so many problems in people's lives related to alcohol and tobacco at that time. Those were the two most visible substances. And I couldn't understand why, despite knowing the harms, why would people engage in that? And uh, I suspected right from the very beginning that there was something different happening in the brain, which unfortunately medical school didn't really comment on because the research was pretty limited at that time in terms of what was happening in the brain. But I've been fortunate through that connection with the military and my interest in preventive medicine. I went on to do a master of public health at Harvard back in the eighties and spent a year at the Addiction Research Foundation in Toronto, which now is part of the Center for Addiction and Mental Health that the viewers may be and listeners may be more familiar with, CAMH in Toronto. And that basically set the course of my life in terms of looking at who people are and what makes them tick. So I feel very privileged to have been involved with that. I've been on the ground floor of the field of addiction medicine with the Canadian Society of Addiction Medicine, the American Society of Addiction Medicine, and the Society of Addiction Medicine. But my interest in consciousness and physics has never really gone away. So I've approached medicine and specifically addiction medicine because it lends itself to that. And along the way in the 90s, I also became friends with Deepak Chopra and his involvement with Transcendental Meditation and his views on consciousness and quantum healing. So it was very fitting for me to, and the connection that, that I pursued. I approach people at that fundamental level in terms of who they are and try and engage them in terms of where they want to be. So that's the general way I've approached dealing with problems that patients bring me, but more specifically, a lot of my practice is individual and group psychotherapy. Oh, that's great. Thank you for that introduction. Obviously, a lot of experience 
you've been able to work in different areas as well, but now you're obviously based in Calgary. What type of work are you doing specifically in Calgary? Do you mind sharing a little bit in terms of what, yeah, your practice is all about? Absolutely. Now? I, when I left the military, I was the director of a residential treatment program in Kingston, Ontario, and I was affiliated with Queens University. So I was on faculty in the department of psychiatry and in family medicine. And then about 2005, six, I got talked into moving to the University of Calgary. So I've been in Calgary since 2006, but despite my initial invitation and interest in being part of the academia, it didn't quite work out the way we had envisioned. So as much as I stayed affiliated as with an appointment in family medicine at University of Calgary, but I've been more in the community. And in the community, through a group of people who were like-minded in 2009, we set up a company called Health Upwardly Mobile. So basically our intention was to promote health and wellness and health and wellness along the four dimensions, not just biological, but also psychological, social, and spiritual. So that since 2009 has been our focus over the last 14 years. Through that, we've built up various programs. And just because of the need in the community, it has been largely related to treating addiction, mental health, chronic pain issues, and disability. Being a physician, I do a lot of work with insurance companies and corporations to get people well so that they can be off disability because as Probably, you know, and the listeners know that disability, not just physical disability, but disability related to mental health is rising in our world, not just in Calgary, all over the world. So that we've been doing very, in a focused way in Calgary, but because of my involvement in the Canadian Society of Addiction Medicine, the American Society of Addiction Medicine, and International Society of Addiction Medicine, I've been privileged to have colleagues all over the world and we are able to interact and help, help people. More generally, we've also been able to publish four books. So one of them is called Addiction is Addiction, which is very specific to addiction. But we've also ventured out into a book called Love the Drug, which is focused on addiction involving relationships. And also we published a book called The Matrix for Life, which is a more general consciousness-based health and wellness book, where we emphasize that the fastest way to contentment which most of us want out of life is not just with awareness, but to get to contentment, boundaries are the necessary variable. And in the matrix, we talk about acceptance. We talk about action. We talk about beliefs. We talk about caring, talk about compassion. The nine window matrix is, is set up to help people navigate through their own inner space, their own mind, and also how to interact socially. So yeah, there's a, a lot to explore there. So I'll try to take it because my mind's racing now, but I'll, I'll try to attack it one, one topic at a time. But you talked about the medicine world and often the reactive approach through prescriptions and, and then your focus being primarily on the preventative side of things. And I think we're starting to realize that a lot, even in the field of medicine, you're seeing a lot of perhaps chronic stressors or, or leading to illnesses, diseases. And often when you start getting to the root of it, it can be often prevented through wh whether it's psychotherapy or not. But a lot of it, it, you realize that people just making changes to their behavior can go a long way. Based on the work you're doing, what have you been able to see and having this newfound awareness, perhaps you already had it because that's where you wanted to shift towards the preventative side, but as society as a whole coming to this conclusion now, what are you seeing in terms of changes that are happening in the field and perhaps some of the impact it's having on people as well? Yeah, sadly, the changes that I've seen in my career over the last four or five decades are not necessarily healthy because our society, unfortunately, especially with the increase in technology, has shifted people to wanting quick results. And pharmaceuticals offer quick results. Like yep. even people talk about 
smoking or drinking alcohol or now smoking cannabis or edibles as a way to cope with life. Yeah. And nothing could be further from the truth. It's actually something that takes people deeper and deeper into disconnection. It is a tragedy in that sense. But having said that, through tragedy comes growth. So when people really get honest with themselves, then they say, hey, this isn't working. I need something different and something that I can get help with. And some people come early, which is what we call secondary prevention because there's minor problems and we intervene early and we prevent problems from worse thing. And sometimes people come pretty late in their illnesses. And we call that still, apart from treatment, we call that tertiary prevention because there are still preventive things can be applied. My interest is also primary prevention to educate the public how you can stay healthy and not get ill. Because the one thing I haven't mentioned yet is I've also had training in Ayurvedic medicine, which is the ancient Indian practice of medicine. And in that, the fundamental cause of disease is in Sanskrit called pragyaparad, which means mistake of the intellect, literally translated into English. And the fundamental mistake of the intellect that gets the body and brain out of balance is that it starts to perceive itself as being separate from everything else. So as much as listeners may have heard that addiction is a disease of isolation, so treatment for addiction requires connection, but it is much more complicated than that. But fundamentally, it is about connection with oneself, connection with other people, connection with the rest of the universe. And in that context is consciousness and higher power or whatever concept of God people may have had. Yeah, and I'm glad you touched on that because that was going to be my next question around the whole aspect of connection and how often people, when they're feeling disconnected, like you said, through the substances, it leads the other way, but they're truly seeking some sort of connection, right? And uh, as to your point there, it's not that simple, but often that is the root cause to many of the addictions. And perhaps we can go down that path of what you touched on earlier as well in terms of the spiritual psychotherapy side of things. So as we're talking about that spiritual side and perhaps seeking that deeper connection, which can prevent a lot of the issues we see around addiction. And I've seen that myself too. What is the shift there in terms of that form of psychotherapy? And one of the things I try to talk about more myself is even in some of the literature I've come across in transpersonal psychology, there is an aspect of, okay, your cognitive development gets you only so far after which people feel like they're missing something. And that's where that spiritual development can be so profound for people to experience that sense of contentment you talked about. But that spiritual path can be different for everyone, right? It doesn't have to be uh, a one size fits all, but how are you connecting the two here and then helping people find that sense of contentment, perhaps that they're lacking and seeking it out in other ways. Yeah, no, you've brought up great points and I'll address them in two ways. One is the cognitive aspect. And in our society today, and it comes from that overemphasis on thinking. So cognitive behavioral therapy has been touted as the mainstay psychotherapy. But unfortunately, just by the definition in the title, it's just thinking and behavior oriented. So people are often given that simplistic idea that change your thinking, change your life, change your behavior. And if the world was that simple, we wouldn't be in problems that we have. Yeah. Because uh, very astutely and profoundly, you've identified that people need more than that. And when we engage people, we, of course, anyone coming in goes through a very comprehensive assessment, which is along the lines of not just psychological, but also biological, social, and spiritual. Because fundamentally, we are biological creatures. Our DNA is what makes everything happen. But then our DNA basically gives us a fair amount of automaticity. And then we have something that we live by experience in our mind. Because often we have people coming to us saying, this is what happened to me and it's just so awful. When that may be true, but life is not what happens to us. Life is what 
we do with what happens to us. And what we do with what happens to us really is dependent on who we are. So when we change, we start dealing with things differently. So even the biggest of traumas, and if we look around the world, there are so many untold tragedies that people live with. Most of the time, we aren't even allowed time and space to talk about it. And that's where we find with our patients that they will come to us with one problem on the surface. But as we start to get to know them, there are many more layers to who they are. And that is where we enter the realm of spirituality because spirituality is basically what gives meaning to your life, yes. what gives purpose to your life. So as much as a lot of people conflate spirituality with religion, and there is a connection because religion gives people a framework and some people are more religious than others and they adhere to that framework and that becomes their value and purpose to life. But even the most religious people they still have their own life apart from whatever ideology they may subscribe to. And that's why I often say that uh, like a religious person may be spiritual, but just being religious doesn't make you spiritual. And being spiritual doesn't require you to become religious because all of us are human beings and all of us have different needs and desires and things that make sense to us or not. So that's how we approach spirituality at HUM is to get people to consider who they are and what are their values and what gives meaning and purpose to their life. And sometimes when people are having difficulty, then we ask questions about their social connections. Mm -hmm. People have a lot of attachment to their friends and family and their culture. And through that, we decipher as to what is it that has been running their life. And then we start ask questions, asking questions about, now, does this serve you or is it hindering the way you want to live your life? Yeah. And it's a painstaking process. It's not an easy one. And it's a long process. So we also have been very successful in providing longitudinal care. So very different than the quick fixes, like even in the field of mental health and uh, psychotherapy, people will often want the solution focused or CBT for 12 sessions or CBT for 24 sessions. And then the therapist writes a report saying, yes, we've addressed all these problems and it's fixed. When we all know human beings are <laughs> not fixable like that. Right. So that's where we focus more on helping people find the framework. And we provide some guidance to that framework that makes sense to them. Yeah. And, and that's where a lot of our work is very individualized. Like even the programs that we run, like our intensive outpatient program, as much as it's group based, but it's very small. Like we have anywhere from four at a minimum to a maximum of eight patients together. And even there, because it's a small group, we're able to individualize their experience. Yeah. So I think that's where our success lies. And that's the approach that I've tried to teach to medical students. And we've also had social workers and psychologists and other healthcare providers come for training with us. And we are open to that. We continue to provide that. From time to time, we provide some public education to corporations sometimes invite us for health and wellness seminars. So it's an ongoing process of both intervention at an individual level and population level. And I think that's where I'm sure the listeners will appreciate that who you pay attention to, who you hang out with has a big impact on which direction your life goes in. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. We are a product of our environment, right? And if we want to make changes, we need to be making wholesale changes. And to your point, as you've touched on a few times, the, the, the quick fix is an easy way to look at things, but a lot of the times it requires like making wholesale changes requires a lot of hard work. Right. And the other thing you touched on was it's not about what happens to us. It's what we're able to do with what's happened to us. And there is a sense of agency that comes with it. Right. And a lot of people are not ready to take on that responsibility and hence why they'll perhaps resort to a quick fix rather than doing the hard work that's required. And as we've touched on often that hard work requires being aware of who you're spending time with and making certain changes from that perspective and then shifting towards the, the spiritual side of it. And I think that's an individual journey that we 
perhaps some of us take on. But the way I see it personally is, is tying that physical to the metaphysical, right? And how do you bridge that gap? And you talked about consciousness and physics and your interest in physics never really went away. And I, I can understand why, because you can tie it all together, right? So how are you able to tie it all together from, from your perspective when it comes to that consciousness aspect of, of, and perhaps even thinking about the metaphysical? Sure. And I think individually, when I'm sitting with patients, I basically probe to see where they're at and then just gently give them suggestions from the perspective of who are you? Yeah. And certainly in the intensive outpatient program where we have more time, we have a very structured session where we challenge people to consider that everything around us is energy. Like even things that look physical, feel physical, we actually perceive it only because we have five senses. So if we didn't have those five senses, we would be totally in the dark. To the extent it makes sense to people that even sight is the visual spectrum. There is something called ultraviolet. There is something called infrared. With technology, we can actually use infrared to see in the dark. I also challenge people to consider that all matter is made of particles, which if you dissect them down, they literally blink in and out of existence. It's a mind-blowing concept. And what my experience has been is when I challenge people at that level, it makes them stop and think that what you're saying is absolutely correct. Because even in high school physics, we all learn about atoms and protons and neutrons. And everybody is curious as to, okay, so what's underneath that? And certainly a few years ago, when there was a big sort of news flash, the discovery of the Higgs boson, which was dubbed as the God particle. Literally, we now have proof that Higgs boson is the fundamental particle that literally blinks in and out of existence. It was very difficult to capture it, to get a physical record of it. So that is the reality. Now, having said that, we still have to deal with the reality of us as physical beings. Yes. But just starting that dialogue gets people thinking differently. And what I try and say to people is that field of energy, and this is where you may or may not have come across these ideas, but in quantum physics circles, this idea is very well thought out. That in that unified field where all forces merged and merge into something that we don't quite understand, that everything is one. And interestingly enough, in ancient India, in the knowledge that has been preserved, and to give it a name, it's called the Ved in Sanskrit. The Ved has always said that we are all, at all times, connected with this field of consciousness. So very specifically, actually, some listeners may be aware of Transcendental Meditation, Maharshi Mahesh Yogi, and I made reference to Deepak Chopra. Deepak also started with Maharishi back in the 80s to connect with this idea, that unified field that physicists talk about and the field of consciousness that is the pure potential that everything arises from, every little particle, everything, that it is one and the same. Because when you start talking about the properties of that, it is identical. So I help people then come forward from that to see and so how that relates to their day-to-day -day life. And we all know we live our life on the outside, presumably, but we really are living our life on the inside. Even here, you and I are having a conversation through this platform, but really Furkan is having a conversation with himself and Raju is having a conversation with himself. And when the listeners are going to be listening to this podcast, as much as they may see these two people on the screen, or if they're just listening to the audio, they'll hear two different voices. But it really is voices in their head because they may or may not ever meet either of us and just will know us through the words. But even those words are not necessarily the words 
that we are expressing. It's how those words impact them. And the way those words will impact them is entirely dependent on where their brain is at, where their physiology is at. To the extent I challenge people and I say, and again, I'm not the first one to say this, that we don't see the world as it is. We see the world as we are. So the more we invest in getting to know who we are, and then growing in that fundamental way to improve our experience as who we are as human beings, that's how our own personal consciousness expands. And then that's how we find that connection that we had started to talk about at the beginning. Right. Yeah. And, and when you get into that space of quantum physics, that can be difficult for many people to grasp, right? Mm -hmm. But one of the things you just said here is we're often our, re I guess I'll paraphrase, but we can create our reality based on who we perceive ourselves to be. And that to me has been a really profound realization because depending on how I view myself or how I want to view myself, I can create a certain reality, which yeah, there is an aspect of quantum physics to it, but you don't need to necessarily grasp that Correct. to be able to perhaps change the course of your life and who you want to embody yourself to be, right? And, and that's where quantum physics reference comes in handy because in today's world, people do subscribe to science and they want to know tangible truths. But you're absolutely correct. Some people will use that as a bridge and will have more connection to it. That'll give them more meaning, whereas others just want a practical approach. And that's where it's totally fine. You can take the practical approach without having to know all the quantum physics connections. Yeah, for sure, for sure. And then when you, you made reference to even scripture, and for me, one of the things I've also come to realize with scripture often is it can read you as opposed to the other way around, which I think is, again, a very deep thing. And often you can fall into this whole rabbit hole if you start really thinking about it in terms of what's going on. But it, I guess if whether you're religious or not, but if you're looking at the scripture, it can have a profound impact on you if you choose to go down that direction. What are your thoughts on that? Because that's something I've been formulating in my yeah, head. Absolutely. And yeah. Fundamentally, what I want to say that there are many scriptures around the world. And I've had the privilege of even having served in the Holy Land to the extent in my earlier career in the military, I served with the United Nations in Golan Heights, which is Israeli occupied Syria, but politically a lot of tension and a lot of things. But being there in Golan Heights gave me a chance to travel all around uh, Israel and the West Bank and Egypt and get to know Judaism and Islam and Christianity at a very fundamental level. And I've had patients from all different religious beliefs and denominations. So I've had very privileged conversations with people. And what I've discovered through my own reading and in talking to people, that ultimately all religions talk about that same thing, which is a connection to yourself. And all scriptures basically are trying to give you some guidance how to be a better human being. And that is fundamentally how we approach life, all of us. So we find values through that or through whatever else. At that level, this idea that you're introducing is something we also try and get people to consider. You may be seeking this, but there are many spiritual beliefs and also written records that this idea of when the student is ready, the teacher appears. Yeah. There are a lot of spiritual religious doctrines that say that our job is just to make our mind fertile, make our mind open. Even in recovery, people talk about when people say, okay, so how does recovery work in treatment for addiction, for example? And the answer is how. H standing for honesty, O standing for open-mindedness, and W standing for willingness. So that open-mindedness and, open -mindedness and willingness then allows us to receive what the universe has to offer. 
And it requires a little bit of suspension of that belief that I am the center of my universe because every one of us is, but every one of is not. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And I don't know if that makes sense to you or if it'll make sense to the listeners that yes, we are the center of our universe in terms of we have a unique vantage point. But we are not the center of the universe because the universe is vast. And yeah. we are put a speck. Absolutely. I think <laughs> the, you can look at it from a couple of angles. I guess one of the ways I look at it uh, more in a simplistic way is how can I see a part of myself in the other person? Because there is that aspect, right? And, and you can see that. But then even from a, if you look at it from it, we're all atoms. So then you have the nucleus, right? Rotating there and atoms do collide, right? So you can also look at it from that perspective. And I do agree with you. It does require that suspension of belief and open-mindedness to really, the way I look at it is having that sense of humility that perhaps you're willing to receive something. And, and to your point, once that student is ready, then you'll get there. But and, and then a lot of the differences I see today in the world where there is conflict or, or whatever you want to call it, it's people often projecting that inner conflict outwardly. And that's where you see it. But once you're able to find that sense of peace within yourself, then you're able to receive a lot more and not judge, right? And then you come from a place of compassion and empathy rather than judgment. I think, I mean, that there's a lot to be said there, but... How do you then prepare people? And obviously we've talked through, okay, getting them to open up to the whole idea of consciousness and perhaps using a quantum physics approach, but how do you get them to even open up to the point where they're ready to be that student where the teacher appears, as you said? Well, you just said something very profound, but I don't know if you realize as to how profound that was, which is that people are engaged in battles a lot of the time. I'm paraphrasing a little bit. That they'll be very deep into a conflict or a problem that they're trying to solve. And what we try and do is help them see as to what is their part in that problem and what is not their part. And often people can do that and then they say, I want the other person to fix their part. Yeah. And then everything will be fine. And what we help them come to terms with is that other part is that other part. You have no control over that person or that other part. If it's a government related thing, or if it's a much bigger conflict related thing that is bigger than any of us. Yes. So fundamentally people need to disengage first. And that's where just simple breathing techniques and meditation is a way for people to start disengaging and connecting with themselves. So as people start to do that, then that fertility and then open-mindedness comes. Like in many ways, we are seeing a sociological phenomena all over the world and certainly in my lifetime, yoga. Like even in India, which is the birthplace of yoga, but growing up, I knew of yoga, but it wasn't as well known as it is today. So yoga has been an amazing thing that has brought our whole world together. And yoga is a word, the Sanskrit word just means union. So yoga as a word means connection. And in that sense, it's been astounding for people to consider that just simple, deliberate, intentional, conscious body movements have a huge impact on the mind and physiology. So once people start engaging, and that's where it is so important to be eclectic because there is no one size fits all. We have a framework and this is what's been shown over and over again in research too, that any technique for it to be success successful has to be invitational, not prescriptive. And as a physician, I can tell you that I've written many prescriptions, even for medications, people don't follow them. But once I have a therapeutic relationship with the person and they trust me, then it's an entirely different experience. Yeah. Actually, I was having a conversation with one of my colleagues before Christmas who was asking me about a particular medication. And she said, 
I've had great success with this medication, but it's not widely used. And I said, yes, I can give you a quick answer, but I'll let you figure out the answer yourself. I said, tell me more about those patients and how you approach them. And as she talked, it was very evident that she focused on the therapeutic relationship. She used the medication as a bridge to connect with them. Yeah. And the medication didn't fix them. Eventually, people stopped taking that medication. So on the surface, even for a brilliant physician like herself, she was so attached that somehow her prescribing the medication means that the medication was efficacious. So why isn't it efficacious in other people and why aren't other doctors prescribing it? It's largely because the substance itself, the med medication itself, is actually not that efficacious. Mm -hmm. Yeah. The research on that medication is not that great. Yeah. But this physician was brilliant with it because she used that medication as a bridge. And that's what I can say for myself too. As a physician, I do have the privilege of being able to prescribe anti-anxiety medication or antidepressant medication. But again, I don't know how many of your listeners are aware that these drugs are labeled as that, but they don't have any anti-anxiety properties or antidepressant properties. They basically interfere with neural circuits in your brain. And they actually dampen them. They actually damage them, which is why when I see people who've been on psychotropic medications for years and years, it's much harder to engage people because their brain circuitry is so damaged. And I think that's the other tragedy as you were asking me and what trends I've been seeing. And that's a very unhealthy trend, especially in North America and a much bigger problem in the U.S. than it is in Canada. But we are so close to the U.S. that we have that problem, but then the problem is all over the world, in the Western world, specifically where people are looking for a quick fix and the pharma companies are very quick to say, yeah, take this and it'll fix you. And yes, it appears to fix you, but it actually makes you numb. And it makes it more difficult than to engage at that level. But as I shared in the example of this other colleague, that even there, there are still opportunities if somebody is interested in a medication, we can use that as a bridge. But the ultimate goal is to get people to connect with themselves. Yeah, I do want to touch on the medication piece. But before that, I, I did want to share a thought because when you were talking about yoga, one of the things that I've come to realize and experience myself is that physical engagement opens your mind up, right? I think it yes. also leads to a place of humility. And I see that in combat sports too with boxing and some of the other combat sports that I've been involved in. And again, there's that, once you're able to get past this physical aspect, then your mind is open to receive more. And that's why I think a practice like yoga can have a spiritual benefit to it as well, right? So I just wanted to share that. But coming back to the medication side of things, I know you talked about anxiety and depression, but another issue I've seen is with ADHD. And again, mm -hmm. we're prescribing it to, to children. Whereas in the past, that's what children were doing, right? That's just mm -hmm. normal. And very much similar to your point, I see a lot of adverse effects with the medication. Whereas I think, I truly believe, whether it's anxiety, depression, or ADHD, we have certain tools we can use to mitigate those mm -hmm. disorders, if you want to call it that. But whether it's anxiety or depression, I see it from a personal side of things too. There are a lot of things you can do. I know meditation is one form of way of dealing with it, but I think there is a spiritual aspect too. And I want to bring that back in here that you can deal with anxiety or depression, right? A lot of the times the anxiety is related to some fear of the future, but if you're able to have a spiritual practice or a sense of contentment within yourself, you can manage to deal with whatever anxious thoughts are coming up for you. And similarly with depression, right? Where if you're able to find some meaning or purpose in your life, then you're able to combat those depressive thoughts or the feelings you might be experiencing. So I don't know what your thoughts are around that. I just wanted to put that out there and, and explore that a little bit further with you. You're, you're absolutely correct. And I'll pick up on the anxiety and depression first. And then I'll segue back to ADHD. Absolutely. 
anxiety symptoms are connected with the big emotion of fear. And it is invariably connected with the future. So anxiety, fear, and future. And actually from an Ayurvedic perspective, that's called a Vata level problem. So if anybody's familiar with our Ayurvedic approach to body types, so that's a Vata imbalance, fear and anxiety and future. Depression is linked with shame. So depression is linked with shame and the past. And that's a Kapha level problem which is a very structural level problem. And in that sense with the disease of addiction, where we now know what the circuitry is that's involved, we talk about it as a kapha structural problem. And it's very deep rooted to the extent that we also talk about addiction being a shame generator, that we don't have the technology to eradicate it because it is a very structural neural circuit problem, which is why depression is so common, both as all of us get depressed from time to time, and then when it reaches a certain level, it's been given this disease status, when really depression is not a disease. And similarly, anger is a very dominant emotion that we experience every day. And anger is a present-related problem. Anger in Ayurvedic terms is called a pitta level problem. It's a metabolism level. And it manifests as stress. So these are all things we can simplify and help people have a more practical approach. Unfortunately, what psychiatry has done over the last several decades is to classify diagnoses on the basis of behaviors. And not just behaviors, but behavioral checklists. The sad is, the thing is, I went to medical school when it was DSM-2. That's DSM stands for Diagnostic and Statistical Manual, published by the American Psychiatric Association. Their intention was good that they wanted to have a common language. And then by the time DSM-3 came along in 1980, it became just the classification of behavioral disorders. And unfortunately, what that has meant is that people think that these are real entities rather than just the classification system. So even ADHD, attention deficit disorder, or ADD or ADHD, attention deficit hyperactivity disorder, back in DSM-3 was a developmental problem. Like only children had it. And I actually remember looking up as the, okay, so where is it coming from? Most of the research in ADHD at that time was in children of alcoholics. That was a curious thing that I put under my hat. And all the years, these years later, as we've come to understand the brain, we know that irritability of the brain that is labeled ADHD is actually the earliest manifestation of addiction. So in our society, there's a tendency to say, we use drugs and then you became addicted. The answer yeah. is no, it's exactly the opposite. Meaning there's a fundamental problem in the brain that's called addiction. And that creates an irritability in the brain that leaves you handicapped in terms of processing feelings. And then you start using drugs and alcohol pathologically. So people, most people who get into trouble with addiction overtly afterwards, they already have addiction. Yeah. And it's the same problem. It's so hard to get people's attention to say that opioids don't cause addiction. Addiction involving opioids is a reminder that addiction problems have been left untreated for a long period of time. But we live in a society where people want cause and effect. Absolutely. So people say, well, my drinking was fine until that trauma happened. So trauma caused addiction. When if I take a good history from them, I can diagnose addiction from their childhood. And that's the beauty when people get open-minded and we have patients who start to recognize that their addiction, because of the nature of the circuitry, and we can talk about that if your listener is interested, if you're interested, really goes back to childhood. So addiction is a pediatric disease and people come to realize that seeking relief through sugar, food, sweets, is one of the earliest manifestations of addiction. Although I had a funny incident one of our patients, a mother, <laughs> shared with me that her seven-year-old daughter was overheard sharing with a friend of hers. I realized that I have addiction when uh, I started yelling at people and I didn't want to, but I couldn't help myself. <laughs> yeah. So that powerlessness over, even when I know something that is not good for me and I still do it, 
That is the nature of the problem of addiction. And that's where ADHD, and by giving stimulants to the ADHD brain, which covers things up a little bit, gives you some symptom relief, unfortunately then covers up the big problem of addiction that people run into later in life. Like there have been cohort studies that have indicated that kids who've been prescribed stimulants in their childhood, they are more likely to go to the other stimulants like nicotine or cocaine. And of course, now we are faced with so many desi designer stimulants, of various combinations of amphetamines. Like I've even had people say, oh, ecstasy is such a great drug. It, it's the love drug. And ecstasy is amphetamines, right? So these are all things that uh, society needs education on and professionals need education on because unfortunately our training programs are not doing such a great job. And that's where it's a personal embarrassment to me having been affiliated with medical schools pretty well all through my career. But the level of impact we've been able to have has been much less than what I would have had to have been. Yeah, yeah. And, and, and to your point, we're in a society right now where there's a lot of cheap dopamine hits and that's not helping either. And, and I guess talking along the lines of ADHD, one of the things I've been able to understand personally is, is a lot of the times, and you alluded to the childhood aspect of it, but relates to our attachment styles as children. And often when you're able to repair that, whether it's addiction related or not, it can have a profound impact. And I'm going to try to tie it back to spirituality again. What I've come to Ooh. find, found myself is you can have healthy attachment. Yeah. Often you need that within, whether it's your immediate family or your romantic relationship, but you can take it to another level when you have some sort of spiritual practice or understanding and find that secure attachment that I find like I can fall back on. And if I'm feeling dysregulated or and that's bound to happen because a lot of stressors in our life or things can come up. But when I'm able to fall back on that secure attachment, it gives me a lot of sense of peace. And for me, that is something that's always there within myself, right? It starts within myself and goes outward, but that's something I can fall back on. And I think a lot of the issues but that with Alcoholics Anonymous, one of the reasons why it's so successful is because they're able to tie it back to that and yeah. heal from the addiction side of things. And we're missing that in society today because we're seeking it out through relationships or our devices, and those can be fleeting, right? I touched on dopamine because you get that quick hit and then you're constantly seeking it more and more of it. So, you're just, yeah. And what I can add to that is that in that seeking is what we call the disease of addiction. We define addiction as a disease that's seeking relief, reward, or escape. Or sometimes in practical ways, we say fix, manage, and control. <laughs> okay, yeah, yeah. And it gives you a surface level relief, but then it gives you dissatisfaction and it takes you deeper in the hole. Whereas what you said fundamentally, that healthy attachment has to be with oneself. And I think I can speak very personally, despite the fact I had such a huge trauma in being uprooted at the age of 15 from India and coming to Canada. Although what I haven't said, that I had even a bigger trauma, which was at age 12, when Richard Nixon was president of the US and the Vietnam War was on, my father decided to bring himself and the whole family, meaning my mother and my sister, just the nuclear family, the four of us that you'll go to America, the land of milk and honey. So that discrepancy between what my view of America was and what I faced was really harsh to the extent that two years later, I didn't want any part of North America. I went back to India. So in 74, when I said, as I said, I came to Canada, it was literally my father kidnapped me I wasn't old enough to stand up for myself to say, hey, I don't want to go. And my grandparents, who were supportive of me being staying in India, couldn't say no to their only son to say, no, you can't take your son with you. 
So, and if that traumatic event in itself caused problems, then I would have had a lot of problems. But fortunately for me, having grown up in India and then having survived two years in the U.S. and then gone back to India for a year had already given me a resilience where I was able to connect with myself. And when I saw dysfunction around me, including in my parents, things that they would argue about, I was able to maintain a level of detachment from that. that I didn't personalize it. Which I'm really astounded by because when I listen to other people's stories, these things are very traumatic. And it was traumatic for me too, not that it wasn't. But I didn't seek escape. Yeah. Rather, my brain took me to more groundedness in myself and to explore. So look at this trauma of being uprooted and being in a new country as a way to explore in high school or university, in physics, and then in medicine. I met all kinds of people. I was more interested in, okay, what makes you tick? How are we similar? How are we different? And then being disillusioned by medicine, I didn't say, screw this. What am I going to do? Or just surrender and say, okay, I'll just become the average physician and write prescriptions yeah. that I'm told to. I decided to join the military. Yeah. And actually, yeah, can I look back, a lot of people thought that many of these decisions that I made were strange because on the surface, I'm an easygoing person. And as in Indian families, people say, I was a good kid. Yeah. And I didn't create any problems for my parents, mm -hmm. except that I did these things that were unusual. Yeah, yeah. So the key is that connection with oneself is so important. And I feel very privileged that I was able to do that early on. And in that sense, that's perhaps one of the things why this is so important to me to share that with other people. Yeah. Say it is central to life because every single, like I've seen very complicated illnesses and diseases like cancer or neurological diseases like Parkinson's or older people who get dementia. Fundamentally, yes, those are all later stage diseases. The fundamental problem is still pragya prag, which is the mistake of the intellect, that you become disconnected. And the flip side I can say to you is, no matter how sick someone is, that you can still do tertiary prevention. Meaning we can still get them into a healthier frame of mind. So whatever their end of life process is, it's always better. To the extent there's been some research that has been done for cancer patients that, and this is not new research, it's decades old, that cancer patients who, in addition to whatever treatment they're getting, if they start to connect with their spirituality and have group psychotherapy and have more social support, and that's why there are so many groups that have been started up, and not only does their quality of life improve, they actually length of life improve. And I can tell you stories of individual patients I've treated who it's just been a remarkable thing. Yeah. What I find in those stories or anecdotes is something spirituality preaches is some sort of acceptance and surrender, right? And that in itself brings a lot of peace and contentment. And we all have cancer cells in our body, right? So, exactly. So I think that aspect of peace can be very profound and, and you see it with people that are in a peaceful state, uh, you're able to maintain this, things happen, right? You'll, you're going to have the yin and yang, but how can you ride that through and, and just maintain like this homeostasis type of approach to life? The other thing I thank you for sharing your own personal journey, because one of the things that I drew out from that and what I find really helps people in their personal growth is resilience. Yes. And unfortunately, we're not teaching that to people. We're, we're giving them often opportunities to blame or shift that responsibility away rather than looking at those opportunities, as you said, that it's what we do with what happens to us that allows us to build that resilience. And that resilience can then allow us to 
just go through life because life is not meant to be easy. It's not going to be easy. So that resilience allows you to ride it through, right? Yeah, one of the things that I say to people quite often is that pain is a regular part of life. I haven't met anyone who hasn't experienced pain. And as patients have said, and I can say myself, like physical pain is physical pain, but emotional pain is always more difficult to deal with physical pain. And even every physical pain has an emotional component to it. So pain is inevitable in life, but suffering is optional. The suffering results from an attachment that is unhealthy to the pain and or an attachment unhealthy to the solution. So if we can look at pain, you really look at our part, deal with that part, and let that other part go, which is acceptance. That's how we live our life. And in that is actually the A column of the matrix, which is, it goes awareness, action, acceptance, and the C row that says, or, and the C row is ABC, which is acceptance, balance, and contentment. So the A column is all E's, which is awareness, awareness, action, and acceptance. And the third row is A, B, C, acceptance, balance, and content. So these are simple concepts. And that's why we wrote that book to get people to really engage. But this is not complicated. Spirituality is not complicated. Because sometimes people won't engage in something because they think, oh, this is too complicated. I, I'm not a physics person or I'm not this person. I'm not religious. But this has nothing to do with religiousness, although we can tie back religiousness. We have had conversations with religious people as well. And that's where we know that if religion is helping people get to spirituality, then that's a very different experience than where for some people, actually, religion becomes a drug. Yeah. Where they're using it for fix, manage, and control or escape, relief, or reward. Right. Yeah. And a lot of the times religious people are not spiritual, right? And we touched on that and it, it does the opposite. So it's again, finding what works for you. And, and we've touched on, there's no one solution for all. Um, and then speaking of pain, one of the things I've heard is, uh, it's funny, but it's true. Pain is the only thing that's real. And that's how we know we're actually alive. I, I often try to remind myself that too, and, and how can I use this pain as an opportunity to grow and, and learn something from it. But I know you touched on medication. I just want to tie a loose end here for, for myself and perhaps the listeners too. But often people can be in a debilitated state, right? Whether they're dealing with anxiety and depression, it can be very debilitating. One of the things medication can often help with is at least get you to a baseline functioning. Right where you're exactly able to right. then cope with things and perhaps use tools. So, so it's often sometimes, it, or sorry, in some cases, it can help you at least to get to that baseline function, but not something you want to rely on or completely be dependent on. Or even necessary. Yeah. And yeah. this is where your listeners will hopefully appreciate it too. Like we have addiction involving opioids where treatment requires people to go on methadone or suboxone for some duration of time because the indiscriminate use of opioids leaves the body physiology deficient in making endorphins and encephalins that are required for healthy functioning. So people are behind the eight ball without medications. The death toll is extremely high. Now that's not to say that people can't get better without medications, but there was a huge contrast between people who can get better with medication support than with, without medication support. But even there, one has to be very careful not to ascribe all success to the medication. You have to be able to go beyond what is treatment and recovery, which is where even in the field, um, we talk about medication-assisted recovery. And I'm a big proponent of medication-assisted recovery. Whereas I have colleagues who are very biological and they say, no, medication as recovery, or they say recovery, who cares about recovery? Medication as treatment. Unfortunately, I can never subscribe to that. But having said that, and that's why people sometimes find it odd. They want to pigeonhole me 
and say, are you pro-medication or anti-medication? <laughs> and says, I'm a physician. Yeah. So by definition, I'm pro-medication. <laughs> yeah. Because yeah. I'm trained in pharmacology and physiology. But by the same token, I'm not pro-medication to the extent that medication forever, because medications do far more damage in the long run. There are very few medications which are literally replacement therapy for hormones largely, which one needs for life because your body doesn't have the capability. So whether it's insulin because your pancreas doesn't have the capability or thyroid replacement when you've had thyroid problems, those are exceptions to the rule versus what medications people need for a lifetime. Like even yeah. blood pressure medications and many other medications that doctors sometimes inadvertently because of their lack of training tell patients this is for life. It's just not true because there are many things people can do which then allows them to have a chemical free experience that is always better than chemically dependent mm -hmm. experience. For sure. And while on the topic of medicine, like I'll, this will be the last question. You touched on ecstasy and we're seeing a lot of uh, research going into plant medicine and clinical trials around MDMA or psilocybin where you're seeing people experience some new neural pathways or, or plasticity from that regard that's really helping them cope with trauma or PTSD. What are your thoughts on that? Because obviously there's a lot of research going into it that's shown yeah. some positive results there's, for people. There's tons of research and you haven't mentioned ketamine, but ketamine is being utilized as well. But these are very powerful drugs and they need to be used very carefully. But unfortunately, even my own colleagues are not that careful. And ironically, not only are they not careful, but because that gets out in the public domain that these are medications, then everybody thinks they can do it their own way. And the tragedy is related to these hallucinogenic drugs, psilocybin yeah. being one of them, but there's ayahuasca and there's ibogaine. The tragedies related to them are far greater. So I would say extreme caution and same thing with ketamine. That the research is not wrong and we need to continue to do research to be able to understand some mechanisms. But to offer these drugs as panacea for treatment for PTSD, that, in my opinion, is a little bit mm -hmm. Yeah, and to your point, caution needs to be exercised. But there is a lot of spiritual kind of practices around these medicines or plant medicines, as they call them, too, right? That's right. So and, and if you look at that research and the cultural experiences, Mm -hmm. The substance is actually a means to an end. Yeah. It's not an end in itself. Mm -hmm. Even right. in indigenous cultures in the Americas, tobacco is a sacred substance. Mm -hmm. But unfortunately, <laughs> the explorers, when they came, they took tobacco and yeah. the whole world became <laughs> exactly. used to tobacco. And then there were doctors prescribing tobacco back a few decades ago. So. Yeah. These are all anomalies of our, our human existence. That, uh, things that have a certain benefit in a certain circumstance as a means to an end, unfortunately start to be used indiscriminately and then tragedy right. falls. In this physical realm, we're susceptible to capitalism too, right? Yes. <laughs> Often that's what happens. And unfortunately, that's what's happening even with prescription medicine, right? But that's probably a topic for another day. But and I, I do want to fix and the chase for profit. So yes, it, it is very much addiction related. Yeah, absolutely. Dr. Jella, anything else you feel like we, we touched on a lot here, but I do want to give you an opportunity. If you feel like there's something else that we didn't cover or touch on that could be a value to the listeners. I do want to give you that chance to add anything else, but. No, I want to thank you for inviting me and I would leave the listeners with that one final consideration, which is actually an initial consideration, we've been implying it, but I want to make it more explicit that people really need to look at, are they a human being having a spiritual experience or are they a spiritual being having a human experience? Because it completely changes the equation. If you look at it, that we are spiritual beings having a human experience and then our spirituality is our foundation. And we can keep reinforcing that to the extent 
what I'm saying is not me inventing. This has been said by many people, many different ways. And as I'm saying this, I'm also reminded of a quote by Nishi, actually. And there's another Holocaust survivor who became a psychiatrist by the name of Viktor Frankl. I don't know if you've heard about him. He wrote an amazing book called Man's Search for Meaning. And he quotes Nietzsche in, in this book saying, if someone has a why to live for, like if we have a purpose, then we can live almost anyhow. Because that centeredness allows us to then keep focused on action with acceptance and balance to get the contentment rather than fighting and thinking that we can change other people and try and change things that we cannot. And ultimately, it comes back to the serenity prayer. I hope all the listeners are familiar with that, which is God grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change, but then have the courage to change the things I can and the wisdom to know the difference. Yeah, yeah. No, that's beautifully said. And, and you're right. I think it's once we have that why, that gives us that sense of purpose and direction in our lives, which often people are missing. And like we touched on, can lead to a lot of, uh, the issues we see, whether it's depression related or anxiety, but, uh, yeah. uh, Dr. Jella, thank you so much. I do give an opportunity to guests to share if they want to ways that they can be found. If you want, if listeners wanted to get a hold of you, what are some ways they could do that? Whether it's online or I think in today's world, and because I've been around for so long, just typing in my name in Google, Raju Ajela, you can misspell it. Google actually corrects you from what I've been told. <laughs> so. <laughs> So that is the easiest way to okay. find it. And I actually joke with my patients because often patients coming in, they've done their research and I say that, yes, so what have you found out? Because I think the yeah. <laughs> cyber world out there knows more about me than I do about myself. <laughs> yeah. so that's one way, but uh, there's the easy common way, which is the phone number. So 403-536-2480. Is the easiest phone number 403-536-2480 to call, get information. We have a website as well for Health Upwardly Mobile. So that's www.healthupwardlymobile.net. Health Upwardly Mobile is all one word. It stands for the shortened version is HUM. We don't have a simplified web address, but again, people, if they type in Hum Calgary, I've been told that the people will be able to find us. Yeah. And I can put that in the show notes too, but thank you again, Dr. Jilla. This was, I really enjoyed the conversation. We could have kept going and perhaps there might be an opportunity in the future to connect again and, and share more yes. with the listeners, but I'm so grateful for your time and your, you know, giving me the opportunity to have this conversation with you. So thank you so much. Well, thank you for your interest and I wish you well and wish all the listeners well. Thank you for checking out this episode with Dr. Hajela. As always, please leave a review or a comments in the comments section. Always love hearing from you. And if you haven't done so, please subscribe to the podcast on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or YouTube. That's the best and easiest way to support the podcast. Also, please subscribe to my new newsletter. It's called Easy Reflections. You can find the link in the show notes or the description. And check out the sponsors of the podcast in the description. Thank you again. And until next week.